As always, good to see everyone out, especially our visitors mentioned that earlier. I count you as our honored guest and hope every opportunity you have to come and to be with us that you will. If you're here not a member of the Church of Christ, not familiar with our worship and how we worship our God, we just simply ask you and challenge you. Ask us the question and we'll provide you a Bible answer for the things that we do in our worship service. I want to go back and revisit an old lesson and ask you a question. Where do you stand? Brother Chip read for us in the book of Numbers, chapter 30, verse, or chapter 13, verse 30 and verse 31. Upon the return of the twelve spies from spying out the land of Canaan. Mind you and remember that it is the land in which God had already promised and really, in reality, had already given to them. It was theirs just for going and obeying. Caleb says, speaking for he and Joshua, we got this. We can do this. The people there, it's no problem for us. If we go over, we can do it at once and take possession. And I like the end of the verse where he says, we are well able. In other words, what Caleb's saying is, we are beyond capable. And I believe he was expressing that because of his faith in God Almighty. But then in the very next verse, a contrast. In the contrast of those unfaithful spies that in their mind said, we're not able. We can't do this. We're not prepared. Because they are stronger than we are. And so as I think about that passage, I'm reminded in my life of how many times people use this illustration to make a decision of what they're going to do. You know, rock, paper, scissors. But that's not the way that it could be in our world. And that's not the way it can be in our decision to serve God. It takes a fortified thought process and a great faith when we think about all the things in which we are up against. And when you think about life, would you use rock, paper, scissors when it came to who you were going to marry? If I used rock, paper, and scissors to determine that, I wouldn't be married to the most wonderful lady in the world. I don't know where I would be. Or how about the decision of where are we going to live? How do you make that decision? Based on many factors, right? Or how about being a Christian? There probably are some people who have literally used rock, paper, scissors in deciding whether to become a Christian or not. And that's a sad statement. But even after one becomes a Christian, our life is still full of decisions. You and I must decide whether we're going to live faithful. Whether we're going to earnestly contend for the faith, according to Jude, verse 3. Whether we're going to stand up for the truth of God's Word. Or as Joshua said in Joshua 24, and verse 15, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It is a choice that we make. And I stated already in, in a simple thing, our text in Numbers 13, it really tells us that there are two places in which we can stand. And so I ask you, where do you stand today? Because we can stand against God or we can stand for God. Let's first of all look at standing against God. And sadly in our world today, and unfortunately, it exists in the church. There are many who choose to stand against God. How do you do this? How is it accomplished that we would stand against God? I think the very first indicator in our life when we stand against God is that lack of faith. You go back to our text in Numbers chapter 13, and you can begin reading in verse 27 down through verse 29. Where it says, Then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey. And then it, that, and this is its fruit. We have proof. We have proof 
that the land is what God promised it would be. Nevertheless, but the people that dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, when we saw the descendants of Anak, the giants, when we saw them there, the Amalekites, they dwell in the land of the south, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, all the excuses of why they couldn't take the land, the ten chose to stand against God because they had no faith in who God was. They had forgotten what God had done for them to bring them out of the land of Egypt. They forgot that God is bigger than the giants of the land. They forgot that God is more powerful than all of the inhabitants of that land. And yet they chose to stand against God. What about your faith? What about our lack of faith? Look over at Matthew chapter 17, beginning in verse 19. There it was, the apostles were having trouble rebuking a demon, and Jesus said, beginning there in verse 19, the disciples came and said privately to him, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said, Because of your unbelief. For surely I say to you, if you have the faith as a mustard seed, you will have to say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible. What is our faith? Is our faith like the, the disciples that came and said, why can't we do this? Why can't we accomplish that which we are striving to do? Jesus says, because you don't have enough faith. And I like the fact that He says, if we have just the faith of a mustard seed, the smallest or one of the smallest seeds known to mankind, Jesus said, you can move a mountain. Well, I believe today we can move mountains, but we stand against God because we have a lack of faith. Or the Bible when it comes to taking the Great Commission in the world. When the Bible says that we're to go into all the world and teach all nations. Oh, but Brother Ray, you just don't understand. I, I, I don't have the ability to teach. No, brother, you have the ability to teach. You have a lack of faith in your ability. You see, we, we lose faith in our own self when it comes to to doing what God wants us to do. And so our lack of faith will cause us to stand against God. But as we think forward, a second way that we can stand against God is very simply by being disobedient. When you go back to the book of Numbers and you begin to read in chapter 14, you will see how the people of that day became disobedient to what God wanted them to be. And because of their disobedience, what happened to them? They were told that none that were under the age of 20 would enter in to the promised land. None of them would be able to go in except one. Except one. Why? They chose to stand against God and they were disobedient to His simple commands. What about us? What about our lack of faith? Our lack of faith causes us to become disobedient. It causes us to be against God. When it comes to worship, in John 4, and verse 24, God is a what? A spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in what? in spirit and in truth. We must have the right attitude combined with the right actions in order to please God in our worship. And someone says, well, the Bible doesn't define what is involved in worship. Oh, but contrary. The Bible speaks that we need to sing, not play. Sing, not be entertained. I was reading, and I'm going to say this is get the shock value from you. 
But I, I, how many of you have heard of praise teams? Do you realize that we have a praise team in South Jackson? Wait, uh, Brother Ray, have you gone crazy? Nope. Our praise team consists of everyone in the assembly. Because we are all commanded to sing and make melody in our hearts. We are to teach one another with psalms and spiritual songs and hymns. We all are to be praising God and teaching God. But the world views it different. The world says, oh, there are certain ones who are such great singers. They need to have preeminence. They need to be important. God doesn't care about the sound of your voice. He cares what flows from your heart. And we are disobedient to God when we change what God wants in worship. Or how about 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15? Study to show yourself approved unto God. How many of us really study God's Word? How many of you really think you know what God's Word says? And you think you know what it says until somebody challenges your thinking. And when they challenge your thinking, they're trying to get you to change what you believe. I've changed before. But my change has always been to be better in my obedience to God. Because I look at Scriptures and I can see different things that they mean. And I can understand that it will help me become more obedient. But many people simply fail to study. Jesus says, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. How are you going to know the commandments of God and of Jesus unless you study. You see, we can become disobedient when we fail to study. And so disobedience, it results in standing against God. But moving on, let's look at the best point of the lesson. And that is, we can choose to stand with God as Joshua and Caleb were willing to do just as God had instructed them, those two young men had great faith. They were ones that said it will be no problem for us to be able to go into the land and to take it as God has promised. They understood that God was greater than any difficulty they might face. You and I can stand with God when we have the faith of Joshua and Caleb. And because of our faith as Joshua and Caleb had, we will be rewarded for that. Joshua and Caleb were rewarded. I said a while ago that one would go into the land, right? Actually, there were three. I said that for intent. You had Moses, Joshua, and Caleb that were promised. But we know later on Moses became disobedient and the promise was taken away. So there were two. Who was it that led them into the land of Canaan? Who was it that led them across the Jordan River? Was it not Joshua? Was it not Joshua who God encouraged to be strong and very courageous? You see, Joshua was rewarded to lead the people into the promised land, to be a part of it. What about our faith? What about our faith? We go back to Matthew chapter 6 and begin in verse 25 down through verse 34. And there Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount deals with the necessities of life. He really speaks about food, clothing, shelter, and those types of things. And he asked us in comparison to things that we can comprehend. And he tells us how much better off we are. He tells us how much better we have it. But when he comes down to verse 33, he said, but seek first the kingdom of heaven. Right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. He's dealing with faith. 
Do we really believe that things are going to be okay? Do we really believe that God is going to take care of us? You see, if you and I don't have that type of faith, then we will never be able to stand with God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. For without faith, it is what? It is impossible to please God. For one must believe that, first of all, He is. He is the one who controls this world we live in. That He exists. We have to have faith that that's the very first fundamental part of faith in order to please Him. And then we also need to understand the second part that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. He is going to reward those who are faithful to Him just as He rewarded Joshua and Caleb. Just as He rewarded His only begotten Son, Jesus the Christ. You see, Jesus was a wait a minute, brother, right? Jesus, He was God's Son. He was always going to make the right choice. There was no guarantee. He had the ability to choose what to do as He lived in human form on this earth. Jesus had to make a choice. Or will our faith be that which, Paul, which John writes in Revelation that we should be faithful until death and we will receive a crown of righteousness. Do we really believe that there is a crown waiting for us? Our faith, our faith will cause us to stand for and with God. Amen. We're moving on. Being obedient. Our faith leads us to being obedient. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 2, it speaks to the fact that we keep His commandments. And being faithful to Him and being obedient to Him means we will listen to the instruction that He gives. How about your children? Would you say your children are obedient when they do what you tell them to do? Or are they obedient when they don't do what you tell them to do? When do you reward your child? Do you reward your child for bad behavior? Or do you reward your child for good behavior? I'm afraid in our world today that too many parents are rewarding their children for bad behavior. And we're setting a wrong example for them when it is good behavior that gets rewarded. Just about every morning, can't say every morning, I get an M&M. And that M&M is significant because it means the little man went potty on the potty. He is learning. Does he always make it? No. Do I always get a piece of candy? No. But it's much more fun when he listens and I get my candy. By the way, that I don't need. Are we obedient by teaching others? How do you teach someone else? You do it by example. You do it by one-on-one -on -one teaching. You do it in a multiplicity of ways. Are we being obedient in teaching a lost and dying world about the saving power of Jesus Christ and His blood? How about are we obedient in our faithfulness to worship? Do we encourage others and are we attending ourselves? Is worship important? Yes. Because it is in worship that we can have a bond to come together one as one. And that we can edify and that we can encourage each other. Worship is important. Are we obedient to the plan of salvation? Are we hearing what Jesus wanted us to hear? He says, except you believe, 
that I am who I claim to be, he will die in your sins. Do we understand that repentance is demanded? Except you repent, you will perish. Do we understand about confession? And I want to talk about that a little bit more. Do we understand that we must be willing to confess Him before man, before He will confess us before His Father? And that confession is not just one time. That confession is shown in our obedience to His Word. Yes. Or will we be baptized? Will we experience the new birth as Nicodemus did? Will we heed the words of Jesus where He says, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And then we follow the example in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 where the Word was preached. And those folks that day, although they had a knowledge of the Word, they developed a deeper faith and the Bible says they were pricked in their hearts. There's repentance. The pricking in their hearts caused them to change and ask the question, men and brethren, what must we do? Yes. Although confession is not, is not specifically mentioned, it is implied by the fact that they were willing to accept Jesus. They were willing to confess that He was who Peter and the others were preaching about that day. And then the example in Acts 2 and verse 38, to repent and to be baptized for the remission of their sins. That is our faith causing us to be obedient. And then also we know that being obedient causes us or results in being rewarded. Jesus, Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says it to be Lord, Lord shall enter in, but he that what? Does the will of my Father. One who obeys will enter in to heaven. Or turn over and, and, and read Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. And read through the seven churches in Asia Minor. And see that while they had their struggles, they were encouraged to overcome, overcome, overcome. And when you overcome, you're going to be rewarded. Yeah. Brother, we can stand against God or we can stand with God. But understand this morning that neutrality is never an option. There is no neutrality with God. And that's the problem we, live, we see in our world today. There are many who prefer to remain neutral. There are many who prefer not to take a stand. Whether it be for the right or whether it be for wrong. In Galatians chapter 1, in verse 10, Paul, as he's writing to the churches in Galatia through inspiration, says, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, notice what he says, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul says, if I was still living my past life as a persecutor, I would not be doing what God wants me to do. Or perhaps we need to be mindful of Acts chapter 5. We ought to obey God rather than We've got to take a stand. You can't be neutral. Black and white, right and wrong. It's as clear as it can be. There's no gray area when it comes to serving God. You and I cannot remain neutral. Amen. We cannot remain neutral. We must be willing to take a stand. So moving forward, you and I have one choice. And that is that we choose Christ. In Matthew chapter 10, 
I mentioned that a moment ago about confession. That is the choice that you and I need to make. Being one who will confess Him, Jesus, confess God before man. So that your name will be confessed before the Father who is in heaven. But many are not willing to do that. And you know why they're not willing to do it? It's because they don't want to deal with conflict. But there is conflict that comes with obeying the gospel. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 34, Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to send a man against his father and daughter, against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes will be those of his own household. Jesus came not to bring peace. Not to say everything's going to be fine. It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter where you stand. Jesus came and said, you've got to take a stand for what's right. If it causes conflict in your family, He says, that's what I came for. Someone has to make the right decision. You know, there are many in our world today, sadly, even within the church, who I say are false teachers. And they are false teachers because they will not take a stand. They preach in vain. They preach a message of emptiness. And as they preach a message of emptiness, they're really preaching a message of false hope. There are those within the brotherhood who deny that baptism is essential to salvation. How sad it is to lead folks astray. How sad it is not to take a stand with God. So the question you have to answer is what we started with. Where do you stand today? The battle, just as it was in our text, has already been won for you. Today, will you stand for God or will you stand for Satan? The choice is yours. If a change needs to be made in your life and you need to become a Christian this morning, you can come and you can be baptized for the remission of your sins. Or if you're a member of the Lord's church and your life hasn't been what it should be and you've been standing against God, you can come home. Confession and repentance. Let us pray with you, pray for you. You know what your need is. Our prayers you come while we stand and while we sing. Jesus is calling.